Hi guys, on Friday the 26th of February 2016, AIRA held its what the fourth event in a series they call Don't Hate Debate for some reason, where this episode was entitled Does Islam Need a Reformation? And the video was something that was like, I think it's like two hours long. And the debate was chaired by journalist and broadcaster Lauren Booth. I don't know who she is. I, th I think her only claim to fame is that she's remotely related to an ex-prime minister in the UK. And she, they called this a debate. But as soon as a hint of a debate came up, she immediately stopped it because she didn't want a debate. So in the end, this is just two hours of people stating their opinions, trying to answer some questions which were posed by the audience, where I, I don't really know how that happened. So there was a, a panel of six people. Um, on, on the left, you have a guy called Safaruk Chowdhury, a theologian, a Muslim. Then you have Abdullah Al-Andalusi, um, a Muslim apologist. Then a, a lady called Zara Faris, and she's just introduced as somebody from the Muslim Debate Initiative. Then you have Theo Hobson, a journalist and theologian who calls himself a post-Anglican. What he actually is from, from his God belief, I, I, I don't know. But he's the one who made the most substantial and, and most fact-based statements um, in, in, this, in this whole two-hour period. Then you have Tom Holland, the journalist, uh, the, the author, the historian, the, the only person here who is not a Muslim who knows Islam. And then I, what I find the most interesting person here, which who is Dr. Taj Harge, and he's introduced as being from the Muslim Educational Center of Oxford, but he's also an imam. He founded a mosque now where there is no segregation whatsoever. So a, a woman can lead, can lead prayers uh, as, as an imam and homosexuals are welcome. So anybody can go there. So he is the one who, who actually has already reformed Islam the way that it should be, well, in my eyes anyway, what it should be in the 21st century. Because he says, let's, let's go back to the Quran, stop, you know, this nonsense of reading hadith and fatwas and, and all this, this other nonsense, and uh, just go back to what, what we want it to be the way that it should be the way that we see Islam. And that's it. So the funny thing is nobody specifies what Islam is or what it is supposed to be and what reform is necessary of what, in what way and with what outcome. So I don't understand why, why they're jumping right in saying that, that they, how should there be reform without saying what this is. And then after an intro, something like eight minutes, um, they go straight to the questions. Um, I don't know, how did they select advanced questions? There's no explanation about how the whole process works and who is doing what, who gets to ask questions, and how did they select the advanced? I have no idea. So the, the first question then is about reform, whether it's about theology or whether it's about politics. Now, nobody has explained that Islam is actually a, a political ideology with a religion, with a God in the middle calling the shots. Nobody has explained that. So we're going straight in with a question and nobody explains the question and people are just sort of answering on, 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 you know, based on their own personal private opinions. There's no substantiation of anything at any, any stage, any point in time. We're now at, at nine minutes. The first one to answer is, is this Chowdhury guy and his answer is, well, I don't know what to call this. It it just simply does not make sense. Nobody understands it. And, and Theo is left like open mouth. <laughs> the others are just sitting there trying to understand what it is that he is trying to say. Because he, he just rambles on about uh, political symbols and, and not, not at all addressing the question. And then he seems to think that everything is hunky-dory and um, the, 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 the Quran, I, I don't really know what it is that he is saying. So if, if the Quran is not fixed, then what is the point? Anyone can make whatever they want from it. So you can't get guided by a text which doesn't provide guidance. And what is interesting, he talks about the problems of, of the Islamic, uh, well, he calls it the encroachment. What, what is happening is that there are more Muslims coming into uh, Europe at the moment, and he says this is problematic. Well, it's interesting, but it's also interesting that he left out like human rights completely. 
And this is, in my eyes, the number one issue. And he, 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 I don't know, he left out the political Islam, the Sharia, and, and all the, uh, the, the parallel society that we are building. He, he completely left that out. And that is the driver why we need this, this reformation of Islam. And then um, Lauren Booth goes to Tom Holland at, at, at 12 minutes, and then he points out the secular approach becoming part of Islam something that Dr. Taj has already implemented, where his mosque allows women to lead prayer and homosexuals are welcome. And he says, you need to square it off with their God, not humans. And that is that is the way it should be. And Tom Holland points this out and says, well, um, if, if we look in, into history, we see exactly this development. And we see a necessity for this. And then when a debate starts, and an ex or let's, say, let's call it an exchange, Booth immediately stops it. And she asked the most most ignorant guy in this entire panel, a guy calling himself An Andalusi, demonstrating at, at 1440 how limited and quite childish his mindset is and how he approaches serious issues. And now he doesn't even understand the parable Tom Holland met. I mean, he, he mentioned Mark 12, 17, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give to God what belongs to God. And, and And Andalusi doesn't understand this. And he says, well, everything belongs to God. And you need to give everything to God. He, but he doesn't understand. <laughs> oh, God, this guy's so stupid. Anyway, at, at 17 minutes, then we can see what a, what a slippery person he is and, and why debate is debatable. And why not rather put the blame on others? You know, like it's primitive. And now they all go off discussing Christendom and how the political aspect is neglected. And oh, goodness. And then we get to the second question, which relates to Puritanism. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, in the beginning, I thought, wow, this is going to be an interesting discussion. But then after 15 minutes, I realized, no, this is not going to be interesting at all. It's going to be the usual, let's pretend there are no problems session. And the others are saying, now, hang on, you have a problem. And the Muslims will just go, no, we don't. And they will just continue doing whatever they want to do. And that is it. So we have the status quo. Islam is dying. And they're saying, well, there's more and more Muslims and, and the percentages are going up. Yeah, <laughs> because this, this is because the Syrians and, and Iraqis are coming to Europe. So the, the percentages in Europe are increasing, but they're declining in Syria and Iraq. And there you have complete lawlessness. I mean, if I look at Afghanistan, like, like 20 years ago, you had a similar situation where the warlords were running the country. And now this is happening in, in Iraq and in Syria. And, and everybody is saying, well, the, the, the percentage of Muslims is increasing. Yeah, maybe in UK. But that's it. So other, other countries are saying, thank you, but no thank you. I mean, if I look at how many thousands, hundreds of thousands, billions of, of Muslims went into Sweden and Germany, for example, it's, it's, uh, it's astonishing. So they're, they're being welcomed with open arms. And then they go and they commit, well, not everybody does. I mean, again, most Muslims are better than their God. But the others still exist, and those need to be the ones who need to be shown, look, this is not what Islam teaches you. And this is why there needs to be a reform. You can't stick to the Quran the way it is today, the way that Islam is, is telling people, no, the Quran is only a quarter of it. Actually, your Islam comes from the Hadith or from the fatwas or, or from, from whatever. That's not the way it should be. And this is what, what people are trying to show people here in Islam, and they, they just simply don't accept it. So, ah, Tom Holland, very, I mean, this is, this is a brilliant point. He says, look, we had the printing press, which enabled people to see what reality actually is, what the Bible says, where before it was kept in Latin so that the plebs, the people, could not really understand it. They could not read it. So only the clergy were able to read it in Latin, and they were the people telling them what the Bible says. This is the same what we have today in, in, in Islam, where it's kept in ancient Arabic, so only the imams can tell the people who can't read or write what it says in the Quran. But now we have almost 50% of Muslims being able to read or write. The other half can't yet, but they're getting there. So half of the Muslims, let's, let's make it half, can read and write, and we have the internet. So, you know, the, the, the printing press of the 16th century is now 
the internet of the 21st century. And this is why everybody can see reality regarding Islam. And that is exactly the point. And that is why we see a need for reformation. It's not that because it happened in Christianity, it also happens in, in Islam. No, 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 that's not the case. It's just that we, we see that Islam is no longer applicable in the 21st century. So we need to go and, and we need to reform it. But some Muslims are simply saying, no, we don't. Let's just leave it the way that it is and, and we'll just go fumbling, bumbling. And, and yes, if some people go and abuse Islam, well, that's their problem. Well, that's not going to work because Islam is dying. That's it. I mean, you need to look at the facts. Anyway, Dr. Taj now brings some really good stuff to the table, saying that Islam today is based on rituals, not on understanding. And that is exactly what we see. And it's quite funny when you think that the guy on the left spends ages mumbling his ritualistic, superstitious nonsense before actually starting to talk. And this is exactly what Dr. Taj points out. And he says that the Reformation is rather a restoration where the bullshit needs to be weeded out and the ideas need to be the focus, not the insistence on 7th century Arabian culture, you know, with the, with the long beards, the dresses, and for the women, the burqa. And then, I don't know what this, this Miss, Mrs. Ferris, I don't know who she is and what she was doing there. She was completely useless because she throws around some red herrings and thinks everything is dandy the way that it is. And if not, the others are to blame. Forgetting that Islam in its current form is, is useless, it doesn't work. And that's why it's dying and dying fast. Where Daesh, and this is the amazing thing, Daesh is the trigger for many Muslims today to rethink their favorite belief system. And then they ask themselves, what is it really based on? That it can be abused to the extent that Daesh is doing. And then they get to the reality. And this then leads to emotional detachment and eventually to rejecting this monstrous god they used to worship. And now after half an hour, okay, it's amazing how dishonest some Muslim apologists are. How can you take what happened 200 or 300 years ago, or take two or three despicable acts today, and characterize that as European values. Between gaps, uh, criminal punishment gaps, the ongoing isolation and discrimination between the genders in this country, and not just this country, but you know, secular liberal countries generally. So I would ask, is this what is being offered? Is this what we are trying to be reformed to? That's horrific. And then Theo tries to explain and define what the discussion should be about. And he states that Islam as a political ideology should you know, it should contemplate the options and recognize that there are options and recognize that there are alternatives, then go and analyze them. And then whether secular humanism is actually a viable option. But someone like Mrs. Booth can't grasp it. She doesn't seem to realize that Islam in its current form is actually dying. And she passes it on to Andalusi, who can't handle it either. I mean, does, and we're now up to the 38 minute mark. Does this clown Abdullah seriously say that communism is an ideology which came out of the West? We need a policy on secular liberalism any more than we need a policy on communism or any other ideology that has come out of the West. He does not understand what was said. And does he seriously suggest that his God plays no role in a caliphate? And, uh, yeah, let's play the usual blame the others game. I mean, this is the, 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 the constant thing that you see. Let the others take the blame. It's not us, it's them. I don't, I really don't get it. Does he seriously think Islam can continue? It, and then he simply lies. Of course, stoning, beheading and, and flogging based on blasphemy and that, this is based on Islam. You can't, you can't have stoning based on blasphemy without Islam. If you take Islam out of the picture, there is no flogging or beheading or stoning based on blasphemy. It's ludicrous. You have to accept it. And then, at, at, we're now on 42 minutes, he misrepresents what, what Theo said completely. And then we're on the 42 marks, and now we have our, well, my favorite idiot of the, I don't know, Aira bunch, which is Adnan Rashid. He misrepresents what Theo said. And can, can Adam present a single action by Daesh not described in the Sunnah? And no, killing Muslims 
is not described in the Sunnah. Yeah, but this is exactly why Daesh is saying, well, they're not Muslims, and then they're killing Muslims, which everybody knows they're Muslims, and they're simply saying they're not. I know they have existed for over 10 years, not two or three years. And nobody claimed that Sharia is the brainchild of Daesh. What a useless fool. Yeah, but that's Adnan Rashid. And I find it highly irritating that Ms. Booth continuously rewords questions as though the panelists are incapable of understanding the actual question. And now we get a question which I find is symptomatic for this kind of event. People get together to discuss Islam. And some idiots inevitably will try and get up and discuss non-Islamic values. Why? How can this Muslim woman in a debate about reformation in Islam propose a discussion on democracy and capitalism? <laughs> okay, this is at the 49 minutes Dr. Taj sets her straight and gets right to the point. And this is, I mean, what an impressive man. I mean, that is what we need today. Brave men who can call a spade a spade and provide constructive criticism of his own belief. I mean, that's an amazing thing. That's super. Unfortunately, when he discusses exactly what Mrs. Booth wanted, the Islam in the UK, she doesn't seem to like his progressive views and cuts him off. So she calls for a question posed by a sister in a black hijab. Now that should identify her. A sister in a black hijab. Well, and then Andalusi goes and delivers one of his countless demonstrations of his mental capabilities. He says, democracy is older than Islam, so Islam is more modern. Really, that's what he says. So democracy is 2,500 years old, so Islam is actually more modern than democracy. It's too much bullshit, even for Ms. Booth, who then cuts him off. Now, after one hour and six minutes, Zara, the, the least productive panelist, suddenly chirps in, completely out of tune, and derailing the points being made about the Christian Reformation. Yes, let's lie a bit more and whitewash jizya and make it sound all cuddly. And I mean, First off, it requires Muslim rule, where a god runs a country, and then people who don't agree with this particular god, who can then pay, die, or leave. It is submission as well as humiliation, as has just been pointed out to her, and it entails a whole plethora of restrictions. Also, we have records indicating how Egyptians were bled dry through ever-increasing taxation by the invader Muslims. So why lie about it? And then when we get close to having a debate at 110, Miss Booth immediately steps in and kills it. It's so sad. She completely forgets that a question was asked which will remain unanswered forever now. In my eyes, a ridiculous and irrelevant question, but it shows how confused and clearly out of her depth she was here. And now at 1.11, somebody raises a great point, and that is raising Ayan Hirsi Ali's five points, already identified and defined. And it's sad that nobody in the panel mentioned them and that an audience member had to do that. And the guy, Chowdhury, the guy on the left, who then says he will address this point, sim simply doesn't. Instead, he goes off and spreads propaganda. He lies, saying Islam can adapt to society, where it clearly can't. When stoning a woman to death for adultery and chucking a man off a building because he's gay are happening today. And then Mrs. Booth goes off and asks for examples. Oh, come on. And then at 116, a very clear and concise question by the rationalizer on apostasy. And once again, it gets reworded and in his instance, it gets distorted because Mrs. Booth can't handle the question. And then, of course, Andalusi attempts to justify killing for apostasy and fails. It's really completely useless. And then Theo tries to bring it back on track, but Mrs. Booth will have nothing of the sort. And now we're approaching one and a half hours and Mrs. Booth still does not get it. I mean, if I work and live in Oman, I'm expected to respect and live according to Omani culture. Why is it then when an Omani comes to my country, I need to respect Omani culture once again? Why can't an Omani accept my culture and respect it? It's that easy. And now Zara rattles off some of her usual non-thinking sentences and then finally shuts up when taken to task by Theo and by Tom. And it doesn't occur to her that Muslims come to Britain and then demand the right to have multiple wives. Like the Aira guy, 
up, up to something green and then demand legal childcare based on Sharia when in Britain. And then Andalusi goes off on a fairy tale rant again. Come on. Daesh is the result of Islam getting desperate. They realize Islam is dying and due to the lack of coherent and constructive ideas, they resort to violence. It's human. It's, it's this blind lashing out. And then 132, blatant lies. Why? Why, Abdullah? Why? Um, beating and torturing prisoners of war. Uh, show me which opinion in Islam throughout classical period or any period, any period has said that you can do that in Islam. Non-Muslims have invented the internet where we can check what you are saying. So why these lies? It's stupid. Muhammad, I mean, he advised his men to enjoy raping female captives and they enjoy it to the fullest before selling them off to the slave market. So why lie about this? And Abdullah does not know the hadith or simply lies about knowing that in Bukhari 111, 626, the Prophet said, and I quote, Certainly, I decided to order the Muezzin, the, the Muadin, the call maker, to pronounce ikama and order a man to lead the prayer and then take a fire flame to burn all those who had not left the houses for the prayer. So how come he doesn't know this? How come he can blatantly lie and say it is prohibited to burn somebody when Muhammad ordered people to be burned? Is he really that uneducated in the texts of Islam? And Dr. Taj agrees, reminding everybody they should be honest with, you know, some of the more. Well, well, I need to get back to him. I mean, this idea that ISIS doesn't reflect Islam, I'm sorry to give, tell you guys, they do. That's what they say. For example, in the issue of jihad, it's exactly the same as the Saudis and the Wahhabis and Salafis. The issue with women, discrimination, subjugation, exactly the same as Saudis, Wahhabis, and, and, and so forth. And the issue of interfaith relations, not have any dealings with them. And the list goes on and on and on. We have to, to, we have to be honest and say these people are doing this stuff in the name of a perverted, toxic Islam derived from the the terrible trio, the hadith, the sharia, and the fatwas. Why can't we say that and admit that? Okay. He simply states how Daesh uses hadith, sharia, and the fatwas to commit their atrocities. And that is correct. So, 136. Booth again. Why and how can reformation be discussed in the context of the UK? Why the UK? Islam is not a UK phenomenon. It requires reform worldwide, not just in the UK. And the UK is not an Islamic country and not even subject to Sharia. So why talk about it? And then 136.40, probably the best point of the debate, which shows how Islam does not work in Sweden. This is a question from the audience where the guy says, OK, how can we have a, a clock and a hadith and they don't work together because it would, you know, the hadith would expect them to fast for two months in the north of Sweden and not just skip lunch and, and especially not in the 21st century. So it's telling how the Muslim apologists on the panel, they, they just start stuttering. Uh, they're unable to answer, and Mrs. Booth quickly aborts. Yeah. And then 138. Now, actually, the good questions are popping up, where a Hindu asks a very precise question, and even remarking how previous questions to the Muslims were simply dodged, and nobody addresses it. And then the emotional outbreak of the gentleman in the audience, an Indian guy, demonstrates so vividly how ignorant Muslims themselves are about their own doctrine. They don't see a need for reform. They don't actually recognize what the problems are in Islam today because the imams tell them what it is, what it says in the Quran. They don't see a problem. That's what we see here. And then Another member of the audience has to set the record straight and point out the dishonesty of Abdullah in particular. But Mrs. Booth quickly runs away and ignores the factual arguments he tries to bring in. Now, where is the debate if Muslims are allowed to spread lies for a long time and facts are quickly aborted? This is a complete disaster. And I mean, this is a era who is a large corporation raking in thousands and thousands and having a turnover of a, of a million pounds a year. And they have like, like really stupid that the cameras don't really work, the, the microphones, um, that they, they switch them off when people are not talking. And then when they are talking, they can't switch them on again. And 
I don't know. This, this, this was, no, no, no. This was pretty useless. And then in the end, we get the summaries where Chowdhury, I mean, he provides a, it's a sorry summary indeed, saying what could have been done. So why didn't he? And then we get an excellent summary by Theo showing that expectations are low, but a start has been made. And I agree with him. We need this discussion. We need to talk about this. But also, this is like, you know, the, the, the drug addict or the alcoholic. The first step is recognizing that there's a problem. And this is what Muslims need to do. And then this, this Zara woman, and, and she's a typical example of this childish denial, totally useless. And Dr. Taj, I mean, for me, <laughs> the most precise and most impressive performance. I mean, what, what he brought up there was really nice, brilliant. It was, it was substantial. It, it, it was there. He, he is realistic. He is living in the 21st century and he's looking at Islam. Yes, he thinks there is a God for whatever reason, but he doesn't see a need to go and propagate this through violence or any other way. He says that in Indonesia, it worked without having the sword by your side all the time. And all the, the different islands, they said, well, we need a God, let's take the, the Muslim one for whatever reason. But he says, well, then let's adapt to it. If, if the, um, the doctrine, if the ideology, if everything was able to go and, and, and adapt to the Indonesian culture, why is it not able to adapt to the UK culture? I mean, you need to first understand what it is that the UK culture is about with the freedoms of the person and the human rights that, that people have. And then you need to go and you, you need to um, assimilate. And that is it. And if you don't do that, if you don't accept the culture, why should I accept the human culture in, or the, the, the culture and the human rights in Oman if the Omanis don't accept it in the UK? And Dr. Taj is the only one who understands this. And then Tom Holland, I mean, he, he provides an intellectual summary, um, you know, like as a scholar, but providing little tangible advice. And then Mrs. Booth, in my eyes, was the worst and, and totally useless participant here. So almost two hours, not very much was done. But let's face it, it is a beginning and it has nothing to do with don't hate or debate. And this had nothing to do with a debate. I think we should have a debate, but there should be people there who know Islam. And it should be a debate where by people who are critical and realistic, not by apologists, not by people who, who like, like go on a, on a totally useless rant, how wonderful Islam is and how in the past it has done so many wonderful things. We're here today in the 21st century in Europe. And we can't have Islam with its cultural values of the 7th century going and trying to drag us down to that level. Okay, this is my summary of this, this debate, this era don't debate, hate, sorry, don't hate debate. Does Islam need a reformation? Have fun, go watch it yourself and make up your own opinion and then put it on YouTube and let's see, compare notes and let's talk about this. Does Islam need a reformation?